Welcome to the Royal Rugby League podcast. This is round three, which is multicultural round in the NRL, and I thought that would be the perfect opportunity to delve into a topic that's been one of the biggest in the NRL over recent years, which is the growth of Pacific people who've gone from pioneers like Alston Filipina back in the day to over 50% of the competition, and in the lower grades perhaps even more than that. And I thought, who would be better to get as a guest than Joe Nulavala, who is obviously played a lot of years, from 1998 to 2013, won a comp with Manly, have to get that in as a Manly supporter. Also represented the Kiwis and Samoa as internationals, worked in the player pathways system at Penrith and is now at the ROPA as player transition manager, Joe Talofa. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Now, one of the things, obviously, you've had such a long career in the NRL, going from 1998 when you started to 2013 when he finishes almost like two different eras completely of the sport from the sort of, you'd have been the first year of the NRL and played in the juniors before that when there was no NRL and it was the Winfield Cup and etc. to 2013 looks almost like today, that's not too far ago. What were your experiences going through in terms of being a Pacific person and how the demographics and the culture of rugby league in Australia has changed in that time? It's definitely changed a lot uh, dramatically, if I, you know, for I mean, not to be dramatic, but uh, I think about you know when I started out, um, we kind of discussed earlier prior to the Warriors coming into the NRL. Well, uh, you know, rugby league was just something that we just watched. You know, it was like either State of Origin or the you know two or three games that they showed. Uh, you know, when we feel cup at the time, and so like rugby league in terms of career, like it will. Or a lifestyle, or or something to aspire to, especially for Pacifico, um, was kind of you know something we couldn't really imagine. Players like Austin from the Pioneer, and, um, and then like especially with the success from the Raiders, like seeing like the Nolan and uh and the rookies in particular, like there was something for us to really aspire to. But I think the where the big switch came was when the Warriors uh, you know, were granted. Uh, to be uh, to play into the, in the NRL and like that, you know, especially for a lot of players um, that were junior rugby league players to consider, you know, that as a as a as a job, you know, as a career, it was something that, you know, it was something that was a really game changer for a lot of juniors from a, I guess from a professional standpoint. Um, but then at this over the eras that I've been able to play over the 15, 16 years that I've seen. Um, it's definitely changed uh, the face of rugby league, um, and I think that big switch and what the Warriors had, um, did was open the doors to you know Australia, the world uh, for players of Pacific and Maori descent to play in rugby league uh, and in the NRL. I think rugby was doing it for years prior to that because you know, they were probably more global at the time. But um, what the Warriors did. You know, I think you can't really understate is that like they open, you know, the, the world to Pacific players playing rugby league, and then for us, you know, aspiring to have that as a career, you know, um, you know, that's kind of you know, you know put a bit of a spotlight on you know on New Zealand rugby league and the talent that they had there, and then you know players from there just you know, started migrating obviously to out to Australia, you know, to buy their trade or, you know, to go, go into the system to be an NRL player. So I think that's, from that point of view, from a rugby league standpoint, yeah, that's been a massive change. And then from uh, seeing the percentage of players continue to grow uh, to the point where it's like close to 50% now. Um, but then part of that too, part of that change that I've seen over the time was also... Um, clubs being more aware or, or culturally competent in terms of and knowledgeable in terms of like now we've got this influx of players um you know how do we best engage with them and um, that's from a well-being standpoint i've kind of seen that change as well and there are some some clubs are still kind of a bit behind in it but you know the clubs that are doing well are the ones that again have been able to you know have these best practices in terms of engaging with the bus field for older players so that's, it's interesting you mentioned the, you know, the, the change in demographics and the way that certain clubs have responded to other and the way that others perhaps haven't at the same speed because we can see now, obviously you worked at the Panthers, but the way that the Panthers have been successful with such a strong Pacifica group of players 
um, Andrew Webster. We we met at a conference two years ago, and Andrew Webster was at it. So if you story about it too. if you want to know, and I think actually at the time, in fairness, Ivan Cleary had just had surgery, and Sir Aldo got COVID. Otherwise, they would have been there too. But you didn't. You could see the buy-in at every level. Um, is that something that you, you know, having worked in the pathway system, if you went back to 1998, the way that you would have arrived in the league compared to where what a young player gets now and the way that people speak to each other, the way that, I don't know, dressing room culture is set up is something that's has, has taken on board learnings from that, from, from different cultures, but particularly from Pacific culture. Yeah, I think in the 98, like... A lot of the focus for, I guess, for, you know, again, I'm just talking about my own subject of experience, was hey, we were just aspiring just to play in the NRL. Um, but as the game progressed, and again, the influx of the, of the changing demographic of players, it just meant that a lot of clubs had kind of had to pivot in terms of the, how they, how do you engage with all these players. Um, so for us, also, it was about not only aspiring to play in the NRL, but to have these positions now, you know, coaching positions, like, you know, administration positions. Where like, that wasn't even something we even could comprehend of having, but again, as the changing, um, as the eras, you know, as we kind of moved through the eras, and then again, we talked about the demographics. Um, like for us as players, once we realised, like, hey, we're gonna need, we have, we need to have representation also to and club that as well. Like, um, why is that? Because you know, it's just it makes. Good business sense, right? Like to employ people within your organisation that reflect your employee base, and so I think um, that's kind of been the shift too over the last um, probably probably about that 2010, where um, a lot of us senior boys and players, and both male and female, were looking at, hey, listen, we need to aspire to these other roles as well because you know we've got to if the game the trajectory of the game is going up here in terms of the demographic of players. Like, we don't, we got to make sure that we re, that we support those players too with off-field roles as well. And so visibility was a big part of it. Um, so I hope that all kind of makes sense. And that's um, then that's kind of where you know over the last few years in particular, like my journey was, you know, that I wanted to be in positions, um, non-playing positions. So again, I, I can best support our players and. We can create these best practices within organisations, and you know, Penrith have been um, in Melbourne. Probably they've probably been the gold standard over the last few years in terms of you know celebrating and um, upskilling and empowering their Pacific Islander players. And maybe it's worth going into because I know a lot of people listening to this one won't quite understand what the cultural differences are. But in terms of a rugby league con- context, could you maybe go into what what the differing demands? Or the different different cultural differences, I suppose, between Pacific players and non-Pacific players are it's within the context of a, of a dressing room and coaching structure and things like that, so that people can get an idea of what you know what behavior, behaviors perhaps needed to change and and how they have changed. Well, one of the biggest differences is just our value system, our core beliefs, and what we believe in, and uh, we're a collectivist society, meaning that um, you know. You've heard that saying, like it takes a village to raise a child. Like that's our our, our approach to anything, and um, that we, our family is always the core of what um, of what we believe. So the value system for but speaking, it's cross cultural. Uh, oh, sorry, we have um, in terms of values, um, but pretty much it's, we have shared values. Where family is one of them. Uh, respect, uh, service, community, uh, spirituality. So, like these, pretty much define um, the values that you know, separate us from non Pacific. And um, it's what, one example I'll give is um, Brian Sok. Like he went and bought his fan, his mum and dad a, a house. <laughs> you know, like people are like, oh, why are you buying them a house for? You know, like you know, and she's supposed to look after yourself. Like, that's that Western idea of individualism, and that's the differences between individual societies and collective societies where we look after everyone where individualists is like you first everyone else second you know Brian out of his value system you know he wanted to look after his family because of all the sacrifices but again that's that collectivist the village mentality that we have um, so that's probably one good example and um, what's the practical application there in the rugby league it's you got to make sure that your 
your organization values reflect your working or your player value system. Why is that important? Is that we all want a sense of belonging, right? We all want to be in an organization, a team that values and validates what you know what you value. So I think that's one thing that I know that Penrith, uh, again, Melbourne Storm have done for many, many years, um, and that's um, them understanding those differences, but then moving towards, hey, well, what's something we can do within our organisation to make sure that you know our cohort of players who are Pacific of the Sea, you know, feel valued and belong here. And what's the result of that? The return on that is that players, you know, discretionary effort, you know. Um, Buy in the high trust of their coach, and then you know they want to play with the pay for their club. They want to go. They don't want to go anywhere else. So, so it's a bit of a yeah cause and effect in terms of um, understanding cultural values and the differences. And you look at um, I know I think the most visual representation of it maybe is that you know players back in the day used to at the end of the games to sort of go off and have a drink with their own players, whereas now you see the Penrith players. And the opposition players sort of praying on the field together, which yeah. is something that you just didn't see yeah. even ten years ago. Yeah. And it's like a really iconic thing that the Panthers do. Or I think of the the Fiji Bati national team singing with the opposition at the end of the game is a totally different sort of um, cultural thing that you would never have seen. And you wouldn't have seen the Irish players singing with the yeah. you know the English players afterwards. And that's a great example of um, again best practice, right? And the the game is creating these space, safe spaces for players to be themselves and that um, these press circles that um, you know players have like they can only do that because they know that they are, their values are being validated and they're not going to be judged by it um, and that's it cultural safety that we talk about psychological safety we talk about and so you know the club and the game is allowing you know for these things to happen and celebrate them but again, what does that mean for players? Oh, cool. Like they can be themselves organically and intrinsically, um, you know, outliving their values because they know that they're in a game, they're in a club, their values, you know, what they value. And I think the other, the other sort of most noticeable change, even in the last five years, has been pronunciation and respect for other people's names and beliefs and things like that. And in which I know I, we mentioned it off air that your name was the first name I realised wasn't spelt like the way it was said. And I reckon that would have been a big battle for you personally to have to fight when you first came in to say, no, it's, this is how it actually is. Mm. And, um, you know, we, we're recording this the day after the World Cup Challenge in which we've had Isaac Tango mm. pronounced properly, one might say, mm. and then Patrick Mago, mm. who is also from the same descent, but mm. pronounced incorrectly <laughs> in, by the same commentators in the same game, which I know. It was the English commentary that I was listening to, or I would assume mm. just don't know the difference because it isn't as big a deal over there as it is here but what is your experiences of that in terms of you know really trying to win that battle which I think largely across the NRL has been won now in terms of most you would know better than me but it seems like far more of an effort is made now than has ever been made in the past. I think like going back to when I started and a lot of players coming through like we're you know minority in, in a way and, and it's actually a bigger story for a lot of um migrant families that come from the islands, they come into the big cities or the big smoke, um, what do they want to do? They just want to fit in, right? And um, in, in this collectivist nature where, hey, we, we're part of the bigger group, but the, the downside of that is that we won't challenge, you know, we, we just want to fit in, we just want to do what's, you know, what's, um, what's mainstream. Uh, so there's good and bad to having this collectivist nature. So um, that being said, so a lot of, when you migrate into like New Zealand or Australia, you know, like you're a minority, people don't know how to say your name, so um, they'll say it the way that, you know, they they see it, like, and for us, we won't challenge that because we just want to fit in, right? And the downside of that is that, that loss of identity, you know, we'll just, oh, just say no about or, uh, but, you know, so that, for us, every time that's, that being said, it's, we're losing our identity little by little, um, but over the, over the years, and like recently, we just brought it up in regards to again the game, appreciating, valuing the individual, and that's a lot of the work that you know, like myself and again the Nigel Bonganas of the world, the David Solomonas, the, the John Hutchinsons have, and these are guys that have been pioneering this space long before I have. That have 
you know, but challenging like the game in terms of hey, listen, like you got to say these players' names properly. Why? Because it's part of who they are. It's their identity. And so, they, so attached to that is the education piece now. So why is it important? Um, since we're on the subject of uh, Isaac, um, he's he's probably a, a, a great uh, illustration of again players or young migrants that come to our country that um, again not necessarily have like grew up culturally um, but yearn cultural identity and so he, he probably grew up through school uh, didn't challenge what people said about his name because he didn't grow up culturally as well um, so you know he was just reserved to the fact called Tago 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 I remember coming to the club and then I remember talking to um, to Credit to Stephen Crider and I was going hey yeah, who's all the uh, who's all the dog shorts or who's all the mm-hmm. you know the you know, Pacific guys here, and he goes, oh, and he's you know pointing out these guys, and you know the Bones always drum ways, and then he goes, oh, I'll take this is someone, and I was going, who? And he goes, oh, um, Isaac. I was going, take her. And in my head, I thought he's like African because that's just the name. Yeah. <clears throat> and then he said, and I go, oh, so his name's actually Tumble, and he goes, oh yeah. So I was going. And I didn't know this, and I didn't even know Charlie Staines was someone either. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, he's part someone. Uh, so, like, I was kind of blown away. And then I remember uh, in passing, I remember seeing Isaac, and I said, Hey, I didn't know you were someone. He goes, Oh, yeah. And he goes, Oh, so your name's actually Tumble. And he goes, Oh, yeah. I just, you know, just, you know, just make just, life easier. Yeah, make it life easier. But again, that collectivist, the downside of the collectivist nature or values is that, hey, we just want to fit in. Um, and again, that's. It's a common thing for a lot of Pacifica youth coming through, you know, um, just you know, again, just sticking to the status quo and not being able to challenge, not challenge authority, all that sort of stuff. So from that moment, I kept, I didn't call him Tago, I called him Tamil. Like in staff meetings or, you know, whenever his name came out, Isaac Tamil, Isaac Tamil. Why? Because I wanted to create an environment where slowly the, he can take back ground in terms of his cultural identity. Um, so, you know, it was a bit of a slow burn, so, you know, but I kept saying Tango, you know, whenever I saw, hey, hello Tango, you know, and just, you know, because I just want to empower him. I've got, I've got a call from Fox, a journalist from Fox News, from Fox Sports, and um, this was weeks, um, you know, months maybe, and I said, hey, just wanted to call you about um, a player in uh, Isaac, and I was going, Isaac, Isaac, and I just went blank, and then I said, oh, you mean Isaac Tango, and he goes, you are the very first person that I've talked to that's pronounced his name properly. Everyone else is kind of gone to default, Tago, Tago, because that's not his name. His name is Tango. And basically, if, uh, for who the, the reporter was, uh, the sports journalist, I just kind of lost his name, but he was calling because he goes, oh, because we just wanted to make sure um, about pronouncing players' names properly. And I was going, I didn't think much about it. And I was going, oh, I thought it was pretty cool. And I said, oh. And he goes, oh, can you ask Isaac if he has a preference? And I was going, okay, cool. I remember um, seeing Isaac and I said, hey, Isaac got a call from the journalist. And um, uh, I get emotional too when I think, when I, I think about it too because uh, it's such a powerful illustration of, again, the struggle of what Pacifica players have gone through for many, many years and like myself. But I remember I said to Isaac, I said, I got a call from a journalist. They were just saying, if they were just saying if um, about your now your name being pronounced, and again, he goes, oh, yeah, really? He goes, oh, they wanted to see if you wanted to be named Tango or Tamil. And the look on his face was like, and the look was like, what? Well, I have a choice, you know? Like it was that that look, and I go, oh, and I go, he goes, what do you mean? I go, oh, have you got a preference? And I didn't understand it until after it. Like I realised the magnitude of what just happened, and I said to him, and I said, I said, yeah, he just asked him, if, you know, do you have a preference? And he goes, oh, what do you mean? And I was going, oh, do you want them to call me Tago or Tango? And he goes, no, nah, I want them to call me Tango. So it goes to my point about this journey for cultural identity and like the struggle that players again just trying to fit in, like they'll just stay with the status quo. But part of that cultural identity is is intrinsically who they are, and when. Um, and, during, and Isaac, he, he, if he was on here, he would tell you that he's he's on the journey too. He sometimes he reverts back to Tago or whatever. But you know, the point is that how can we empower our players? Um, and so, 
we did a uh, we talked about the Talano session yeah. with David Lakisa, but we did a, uh, a Talano session with Channel 9, the world, uh, Wide World of Sports team and yeah. the Air Commentary team. I told that story about Isaac Tamo, and that was, if I'm correct in terms of my timeline. I think it was magic round because I saw David there and he was telling me, but he said, Oh, I've done it for Channel 9. I don't know if it was that. No, 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 it one. wasn't. Well, I think it was, oh, maybe. It was a couple of years. I think it was around that time. Yeah, Magic Round. Yeah, Magic Round. Because yeah. he was up in Brisbane, you've never seen a happier looking man that he'd got to tell. Yeah. And he was like, they're actually changing. You know? Yeah. Well, that, that was, so I told that story at that, um, and I think it was after State of Origin 2 as well, because I remember Freddie and them being there. Because they did, I, I, the same year yeah. they did, um, they had Pacific tests. Yeah. And so we, we were noting that on the broadcast, yeah, they were saying they were saying all the names suddenly changed. And we so were like, this, this is, is my point. So we did a we did a workshop with the World Wide World Sports Team, uh, and it was a Thursday, I believe, and it was the Pen uh, the Panthers were playing Newcastle on the Sunday afternoon. So I think this was after State of Origin on the Wednesday, and um, so we did the workshop on the uh, Thursday, and I remember telling that story about Isaac. And like I got emotional saying it, uh, but I said like, and I said, you know, this is why it's important, you know, for players like Isaac to feel that they have a sense of belonging and they, they have a pride in who they are, because you know, again, for a lot of our young people that have migrated and have a disconnection with the culture, like that's why they default back to what other people say because like they're afraid of not looking, you know, looking, interrupting the status quo. But I told that story, uh, I forgot who, oh, um, the commentator on the Sunday at the game, and remember saying, oh, um, Thursday, did the workshop, his name is Tamil, I told him that story. On the Sunday, I was watching the game uh, on live, and there goes, and I remember, I, I remember clearly, he goes, oh, Jerome, Jerome, to Tamil, Tamil, to May, May scores in the corner. And I was just going, oh, it just blew my mind that, you know, that the it's an entire summer yeah, of production that yeah. one. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> but the journalist, like, and I said, the comment, the comment you out, um, the fact that you know, a week or two weeks before he was saying Tago, but then he went and said his name properly the next Sunday. So um, I tell that story because it's such a powerful illustration of, um, I think, in the past when it comes to players' names being pronounced or pronounced properly, I think for a lot of commentary guys, it was just kind of just tell us how. It's pronounced, you know, send a voice message, you know, set, break it down for us. But the approach for us this time around was that, no, you need to know why it's important. You know, we can tell you how to say it, but you have to say, you know, know why it's important to pronounce it. Because it's just, the name is just not a representation of the individual. Again, there's this collectivist, it's our history. There's a history in... You know our our names. It talks about our you know the people before us, our elders. You know, and the rich history of the land in which we belong to. So, uh, I think that approach um, this time around for a lot of our commentary team, I think they kind of see the, the value in that. But the the direct result of that is that players wanted to stay in the game. You know, players being validated. Players who valued um, not only in the pronunciation of their names, but also their cultural practices. That hey, like we appreciate that this is part of who you are. Hey, happy prayer circles, you know. Um, so part of that uh, Talanoa session that we did with nine, I sat with. We did a small group, the breakout groups, and I sat with the digital team, <laughs> and they were saying, oh. You know, they were really moved by the stories that we were telling. Like, oh, hey, like they were saying, oh, how, like, is it okay, you know, when they pray? Like, what do we do? Do you, do, you, <laughs> do we film it or we don't film it? And, and the kids have said, but no, film it, but be respectful, you know, don't go in the middle there, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, because, like, that's not organic, you know, that's not what, but it's, you know, so, hey, what's something that Nine can do, <laughs> you know, so now you've seen them film it. But, you know, I get being respectful, but they're highlighting it by, based on now this approach and by why it's important. So, um, yeah, I just I always love telling that story because, you know, it's the journey, right? It's, it's, it goes back to, harking back to when I started in 98, like, you know, again, this kid that just, you know, was ashamed to, you know, say that I was someone or, you know, did, hey, or just say, you know, guys, people making a meal of my last name. But I wasn't empowered to do it. But, you know, as the... 
as the game has shifted and they're going to have more players like myself empowered, uh, educated and being a voice now for others um, like your Isaac Samuels and you know those guys now so they can feel you know empowered to you know empower others as well so. and in, in your own experience as well I would think I think of guys like Tamo and Luai the fact that they play for Samoa and for New South Wales for example in Luai's case and Critter as well that they can play for New South Wales and be say well this my rugby league life was given within New South Wales you know be from Mantra or from St Mary's or wherever and say that there's this other part of me that I get to celebrate as well that's you know you played in the 2000 World Cup I can't remember if you beat Ireland or not, but I was there. Uh, <laughs> now they, now they, they beat us. Oh, yeah. we, go, well, so we call them we. Right? <laughs> uh, but from 2017 onwards, when we see the the switch to people representing their Pacific heritage and what good that has done for, not just for um, for Pacific people in terms of having that pride in the in the jersey of Toa Samoa, Mate Mata Tonga, mm. Fiji, etc., but also like, how much better that's been just for rugby league as a whole. We've seen obviously Tonga, the big stars of the 2017 World Cup, and Samoa in the 2022-2021 edition. For someone, you know, you're obviously engaged with that culture, right? But a lot of players who grow up Samoan aren't. Like, they're not. And to be able to go to that environment with, I think of Mati Tapa, who would be like the main guy, mm. like the cultural leader almost, or CS Oliola previously, mm. in terms of, you know, the way that some people grow up very engaged with it and some people grow up sort of almost ashamed of it or not engaged at all. And we find we find this in Indigenous, in the All-Stars game as well, where players go almost not knowing that they're Indigenous. I think Wade Graham, maybe, hmm. didn't know he was an Indigenous. He didn't Nico play Hines for one year. Nico Hines story. And Nico Hines. So it's hmm. something that, like, rugby league can also contribute back to the culture in, in that way as well, by giving these experiences that otherwise wouldn't exist. And I wonder if that fits into the sort of the service community aspect as well where you know you hear players talk about it and say when I play for Samoa I'm playing from my grandparents who moved to Australia or my parents who moved to Australia with nothing and this is how I can repay that dedication is by repping this jersey and, and representing that that nation as opposed to for example Australia or New Zealand so what you just what you just said demonstrates you know or endorses what I said about collective our, our collective study that you know why are we so emotional when it comes to playing when the Samoan anthem plays? Why, 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 like, why is it so important to us? It's because, again, intrinsically, like, our families are so important to us. Our culture, where we grew up that way, like, intrinsically, our, our culture is a part of us, regardless of, you know, how much or, you know, how little you know. But that's, that's ingrained in who we are. And there's a saying, um, a really good friend of mine, um, she works down at the Rebels, but she said something really profound at that Tala North session. Have you heard the phrase plastic? Plastic? It's well, as an Irish person with an English accent, I'm yes. well aware of it. Yeah. Well, yeah, again, it's in all different, um, in all different societies, right? Like it's, uh, it's like it, it's a bit of banter, but it, in, in its true form, it's a derogatory term of to people that like, you know, claim to be part of the culture, but you know, you know, they. Um, aren't part of the culture if that kind of makes sense or you know yeah there's sort of in, in Irish people it always be all the people like me who grew up in England or yeah. in America or Australia yeah. say oh well you're not proper you're Irish proper, yeah. but there's and that's like yeah there can be bad sometimes but that can hurt like for you know you heard like I, I didn't grow up culturally as well like you know I you know speak you know you know all right someone but you know I'll be classified as a you know as a um, as a plastic someone, you know, because I don't know the language really well or don't know the, the custom, the culture. And, like, to me, oh, I can joke it off, but I can tell you, like, that, that that's why so many of young, our young people are so disconnected to culture because, you know, um, again, from within our own, our own people, like, just how that makes us feel. Um, but there was something that a, a very good friend of mine said, and uh, it was so, I, you know, you, I get emotional saying, but she, she said that there's nothing plastic but the blood that runs through your veins. That's a good line. Yeah, and I was just going, and it just blew me away because, you know, that, um, you know, when she said that, like it healed, you know, and I mean, anyone that's interested in, in possibly youth or people, you know, that, you know, have felt that in their lives, um, you know, it just healed, you know, it healed something within, you know, all of us, you know, because we're all yearned, like the Isaac Tunnels of the world, like, again, it didn't grow up culturally, but there's this yearning for it. 
you know, but, you know, what qualifies you being Samoan? What qualifies, qualifies you being Irish? Like, you know, what you, you know, how much you know or don't know? It's because you, you know, you are Irish, you know, regardless of what you do know or don't know. And same as for Samoan Tonga. So, you know, I even bring that up, like, because, you know, again, there's part of this education piece now. What we're, what we're essentially trying to do is bring, connect our, you know, the disconnected, we want to connect them back. And that's what a lot of our, you know, our teams are doing now. So Indigenous uh, or Indigenous all stars, big focus for them during the week. Man, I can guarantee they're in a camp. They don't care about rugby. <laughs> they care about investing into their culture. It's the same for same summer camp. You know, it's that you know they invest in the culture, um, and which is important in terms of you know why players now gravitate towards you know playing for their country of heritage as opposed to you know your you know, tier one nations where really, because you know they get that now and that's that's what I love about what Tonga did I mean you know the Andrew Feeders and, and Jason Tomorrow was like they said no we're not paying for the money because well, that was the leverage right to pay for yeah. tier one nations was because man you got to get 30k over <laughs> over eight weeks yeah probably nothing <laughs> yeah spread for some or Tonga I mean like you know, there's lots of work that we're doing obviously from a from a professional standpoint for those those emerging nations but like now players are going forget about the leverage of money like it's our pride in our culture now and that's why a lot of our teams are gravitating towards that and I think um, you know again the players also do have good wages as well so again like like again money is not a leverage now for to play in those teams so but they've always wanted to play for them but again like who's going to say no to 30k who's going to say no like you know like um, but now, again, players are, you know, players are recognising like they, the passion, you know, to play for their heritage teams. Like. Just thinking of the team that you played against in two thousand, the Irish team. I can't see how that island team, which would have had maybe Ian Hare and Brian Carney, who were born in Ireland mm. and all the rest of have been Australian or British people with my accent and people with Australian accents mm. but if you look at the teams from the soccer teams from 88, 90, 94 in Ireland that all qualified for World Cups European mm. Championships there would have been 50% guys with my accent mm. the best players guys from Glasgow guys from mm. Manchester Leeds mm. all over and I think that 2000 Island World Cup team doesn't exist without the cultural growth that came from uh, from introducing the, the diaspora into the national team, which you never qualified or achieved anything until you put in the guys from the diaspora and suddenly became one of the best teams. Mm. And I think if you look now, we just had the African Cup of Nations in soccer, and you've got entire teams of guys from you know Cape Verde who all grew up in Portugal and mm. Europe. You know, there's a guy with an Irish accent playing for Cape Verde. It used to be the other way around. <laughs> we, took play- we took players with the wrong accents and now players who grew up in Ireland are playing for other nations. And you look at how much that has enriched the sport. Like, that's something that I don't think rugby league makes enough of, that we, the rules for rugby leagues in internationals, particularly in respect to Pacific people and making Samoa, Tonga, Fiji mm-hmm. to the best possible teams that they can be, yeah has made our sport better and actually other sports and I feel like a lot of people complain about it every time I write about it I'll get the comment section going you know it's these people aren't from wherever and I think well other other sports have copied our rules because they work so well and they make the game both more interesting as a just as a product to sell to the public to you know tv rights and tickets and bums and seats but also so much more valuable to the actual people participating like I I've never met a player who played for one of the island nations who ever thought it was it was it wasn't the greatest thing that they'd ever done, you know. Yeah. They always say state of origin is the pinnacle in terms of you know, if you ask a drum they buy somebody like that, they say state of origin is the pinnacle as a football player. But Samoa is the most important thing that I did. Yeah. Like and I think that's something we've that we've really moved forwards on. And I think the RFA actually has has been really big on that in terms of understanding that the player group wants that to happen often more than the administrators do um, yeah, that's a good point as you raise and again I get, I get 
but I'm not mentioning a few, but it's, you know, for, it's, again, that education piece or for non-Pacifica Māori to understand, like, just how culture for us is how much we value it. And the great example is the last World Cup. Um, forget about the rugby league, like, you know, again, and obviously some of did, like, amazing. But what I loved about, like, not only the success of what they had on the field, but what we were doing off the field. You were having parades, like, in places like the Utah, Vegas, right. Utah, places that don't play rugby league, you know, like, you know, and, like, all these places, like, I remember in Europe, they had, like, a parade, you know, like, like I'm after the Western Sydney, like, man, it was just crazy, crazy time. I can tell you, every, I was a Tonga <clears throat> VPNG, yeah. and I've got a, every single Tonga in, yeah. in the UK was stood behind the goal, yeah. I think, and it was the biggest thing that had ever happened, <laughs> that, you know, Fu Fu Moimo was in the middle of them, because <laughs> he just wanted to be with, yeah. he could have gone and sat in the posh seats, because he didn't know all the players, but yeah. he was like, no, I've got to be in the middle with all the, <laughs> the, the drumming and the flags and everything, and for as a you know for the paying public from St Helens where the game was, there could have been nothing more exciting yeah. than the fact that every time I thought this was the greatest thing that ever happened yeah. to them. So sport aside, what united us from all parts of the world was our culture. You know, it wasn't the fact like we had guys like you know Tua Sangai Law from you know the Dolphins giving a shout out, the Rock giving a shout out. Mm. Like you know these guys are from different codes, but what brought us together was our culture. You know that, and that's, I guess what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to highlight to non bus because they're like, our culture is just so important. Like you know, and that's why we get so emotional, and that's why we're having all these parades like all over the place. People are going crazy because it's our culture that unites us. It's not the sport, you know. It's the, our culture that unites us, and that's what we celebrate. Like you know, whoever, man, that's probably a good time if you were making flags around that time. Geez, you would have made a. Made a bit of, I think money. they sold out. I think somebody. I remember reading the story. I was obviously in England. Yeah, like, I think they sold out. You yeah, couldn't buy a sample. Couldn't buy. Them. You know, or there was a um, the big ones you couldn't couldn't buy because they sold out. But yeah, it, as I mentioned, the the point is is that like in, uh, for those who are non Pacific, non Maori, like if you're wondering why, if that that's a great illustration of why how our how strong our culture is to us in there, you know, for clubs in particular, organisations that have got a high you know, population of Pacifica, you know, one of the best things you can do within your organisation is, again, that your values within your organisation reflects the values of, you know, of your players and so, or your employees. And it's, you mentioned the phrase cultural competence before, and I, I think David, like you said, described it as being like a non-negotiable now, it's something you have to factor in. And you, you know, I think of um, what Webby's done at the Warriors, where you know, I have no idea what it was like previously at the Warriors at all, and I wouldn't want to cast aspersions on it at all, because I don't know. But you can see almost overnight a shift in the mentality around that group, which is largely the same group of players who played, you know, abro- I think playing ab- abroad in Australia for so long, away from families, away from that sort of stuff, and you put them back in New Zealand, and I, I can but I would be amazed if Webby hasn't put this front and centre of how he deals with sort of the, the man management style at the Warriors, like every team can do tactics on the field, but not every team gets the the discretionary efforts and things like that that you, you described it as before. And I wonder if that's something that we could, we can now look at as being, you know, not only is this the way to win in rugby league, like from a pure, if your goal was, because I know some people will listen to this and go, this is all very wishy-washy, you know, form a prayer circle, take your shoes off and hold hands with each other. But that's the best way to win. It's, it's not a. It's not even even if you weren't didn't care at all about cultural sensitivity. You know, say it's all woke nonsense or whatever. This is how you win rugby league matches these days, and that's something that I think, like Webby, has, has proven at the Warriors. Well, since you brought up Webby, um, I did a presentation, um, a keynote address to the IS last year, and basically it was, you know the correlation between high trusting environments and how that translates to high performing teams. High trusting environments correlates to high performing teams. The uh, you kind of mentioned Webby, that Telenor session conference mm-hmm. that we went to. So uh, I thought about our club. We've probably got the, you know, if not the highest bus figure representation within our, you know, playing cohort of players. Not in, in our own, but also in our genius, like, yeah. genius is like crazy. Um, so for me, um, being at the club, I was thinking, well, you know, 
how can I upskill our upskill our coaches in terms of how they engage with the Pacifico? Like how do you again? How do you get discretion effort? The only way you get discretion effort, um, or one of the main ones, is through building trust. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a story as old as rugby league, but like you try harder for your mates. It's not a, no. it's not an anti rugby league. Lots yeah. of people understand that as yeah. an idea. Yeah. For those that don't know what discretion effort is, you know, there's when you sign a contract, you've got, you know, your like a base level, of base it. level of what you need yeah. to meet to your contract. You know, your discretion is going above and beyond that. How do you go above and beyond that? Is like, if I don't trust you, I'm just going to meet the bare minimum of my yeah. contract. But you know, because I, you know, man, I've it's like the difference pool. between people who are pay, playing for a paycheck, which is like mostly totally fine. Like yeah. you get paid money, try hard. But then, like saying, actually, I'm playing for my mates and something else that goes beyond that. Yeah. I'll run it through a book wall for you. That's what discussion is. That's how I describe yeah. it. You know, like because I love and cherish you, because I know that you'll do anything for me. So I'll go above and beyond. Like I'll protect you in my life. You think about that parent side, what are they doing for Ivan? <laughs> yeah. For me, when I was thinking about oh, when this Telenor session came, conference came up, and me and Lakisa, you know, we're man, really good friends for years, um, I said, man, this would be great for our coaches to to go somewhere about inviting Webby, send an email to Webby, Sarah and Ivan. Um, as you mentioned, I've got Ivan's knee uh, and then Sarah got COVID and Webby, only Webby could come. And I said to Webby, I said, hey man, listen, um, like, if you can't make it because Sarah and Ivan's not coming, like, it's all good. Like, uh, it's only good. Nah, I'm going to be there. Nah, this is important. That's what he said. So I was like, cool. So we went to the conference, as you know. So one of the, um, and this is, I've actually interviewed Webby about this last year in November. Because uh, I wanted to, oh, I wanted to understand him attending that conference and how much that changed. Because that was before the his appointment was before the, the conference yeah. was before his appointment. So you've stolen all my ideas here, but okay, thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's why I, I had that idea last year. I was like, I should interview Webby about this. No, I want no, 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 no. Go, but, oh, I'm now going to go listen to yours. So um, I don't know if you remember part of that conference that Dr. Sierra Kyung yeah. presented. Uh, her obs- or she did her PhD paper on trust the process. Yeah, and you know, I bore the listeners in terms of like you know, um, all the logistics of what she did. But one of the main outcomes out of her PhD paper was that because um, she wanted to understand why Pacifica players were kept saying to her, "We just need to trust the process. You need to trust the process." What she found out was is that they weren't trusting the process; they were trusting the person involved in the process. And I remember talking to Webby, and Webby, that blew his mind. Yeah. Like, and again, and I've known Webby, we worked at the Tigers together before we went over to Penner ourselves, you know, he is a relational person. So, like, he's just, he just loves people, you know, and like, um, and that's, if you see why they've had the success of the Warriors, is because, purely because of his, you know, who he is as a person. For me, I look at the Penrith and like those teams, oh, Generally speaking, like, um, I, you know, organizations are just a reflection of their leaders, correct? Yeah. You know, good and bad. So when I look at Penrith, Penrith is a direct reflection of who Ivan is and who Matt Cameron is. And from my experience to the successes that I've had and the successful teams, the best teams that I know are the, or the leaders are the relational leaders that build high trust that you know that you can trust them you know and, and I've been with organisations that you know, um, and I've um, and I've interviewed Ivan as well because I wanted to talk to him about his time before I did this, I did this keynote address at the IAS like his time at the Warriors and how that contributed to his coaching style and like man he's got an awesome answer to him um, you know, if you ever get the chance to talk to him, but he read this book and this, uh, and I guess everything I'm just talking about is underpinning, what underpins for me, the, what I'm saying is trust, you know. So I have read this book, it's called The uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And the underlying factor of a dysfunctional team is the lack of trust. <laughs> and it's the results, there's five layers of L, five many layers, but... What, what contributes to dysfunctional teams is the lack of trust. And so I guess what I'm just, what I'm trying to 
mentioned is just like high trust in environments because to us as Pacifica, like that's like trust, the relational, the relational space to us is, is sacred. Um, we call it the VAR. I was about to say, yeah. this is the things I've learned. Yeah. It's the, the space between the space. Space in between. Space, the relational space. So that's sacred to us. So how we navigate that relational space with the VAR determines the strength of that relationship. And, um, and when I think about this, I think about the, man, the hundreds of Pacific players that I've, that I've played with and, and me included that, that that space has been violated by coaches, you know, yeah. that, um, the sacredness of that. And like, in, it's, it's a, it's a complex thing playing an elite sport because, you know, it's a result based business, you know, and like, um, but, you know, for me, I was going if, only coaches could understand how to navigate that bar, you know, how to how, how do you build that relational space. There's so many play, so many people have said to me, Oh man, how do I how do I deal with this player of Basuka, you know, background? How do I deal with this on this game? This is how you you gotta build trust with them, man. Like, yeah. you know, there's no ifs or buts about it. Like and um um and that's the whole purpose of why I invited those coaches or the coaches team to the Talamo session. Um and you know the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, yeah, in terms of what they're doing now. So, and you see, like, you just just because you mentioned coaching, there is still it's sort of the the glass ceiling maybe for Pacific people is that we've only had, um, well, you have now Benji Marshall, obviously is, is Mari, but we have, we have Willie Poaching, who was coach in Super League. Yeah. I think Jim Dimmock, I didn't hear him coach at the Bulldogs, yeah. and as far as Pacific coaching figures, that's about as far as you get, yeah. and that seems to me the next. The next barrier that, that needs to be overcome because there is, yeah, I mean, it's a, it seems to be a glass ceiling, and I, I wonder what your your thoughts are on how how we break through that as a what sort of the next step. Yeah, it's it's for organisations to create those pathways, like if they can see that, and I'm not I'm not um, I'm no I'm not in favour of quota systems or I'm not, you know you have to earn where, you know, you have to earn your spot or, you know, your competency will get you through, you know, I don't want people to give people opportunities just because there's a quote, oh, we're just doing a nice thing. But like, you know, there's got to be some sort of, you have to earn it. Like, um, I like to think that I've got this position because, like, I've earned it, you know, and, um, and that um, being Pacifica is, like, a bonus to that. Yeah. Um, but that being said, like, you know, that's for organisations to understand, okay, like looking at your employee, how do I, like, you know, how do we, you know, what's best practice, you know, in terms of like our, our business. Um, we'll take a for example, like they employed me, you know, in, um, but we've got a big bus cohort within our juniors. So, you know, like I saw my role as a bridge, you know, talking to coaches, you know, they'll talk to me about, oh, so and so and so plan. I was like, oh, I'll kind of give them a background, you know, give them some, you know, some tips. I'll maybe do this differently. And, you know, and um, again, I used that example of, oh, you know, head coaches going to the Tullamore session, like, you know, those type of things, you know, building, um, you know, that in terms of, best practices in terms of dealing with your co-older players and but that's I only could do that because the club allowed me to do that you know yeah. they, they looked and okay cool like we're not the experts <laughs> let's get an expert and you know we'll get someone and um, the two years that we were there um, uh, I'd love for you to go online but we had uh, our bus speaker experience uh, cultural nights yeah, uh, like unbelievable. Like it was, it was so good, and um, you know, and it was, you know, I started again because the club allowed me to do it because they saw the, you know, and Ivan, you know, he was here, he, he was a massive advocate for it, you know, because he sees the importance of it because he came from New Zealand, he saw what this our culture meant to us in celebrating that. So, um, so that's for organisations to, you know understand that RPA a great example like can come December you know they reached out say hey Joe would love for you to be part of the you know the um, you know the team here uh, because the RPA understand like they have the they're representing the players which is 50% which is 50% of Pacifica yeah. so um, I think it's even more if you include the NRLW yeah. 
yeah, that's even higher in the W. So, like, just to have, um, and it's it's not a matter of, yeah, yeah, in, in a sense, yeah, it's a matter of race. But you know, me addressing Pacifica as opposed to someone else's non Pacifica, like, what? Well, how would the, how would that message resonate more, or would the message resonate more if it was delivered by, you know? But that's because, you know. They know that I understand. I'll go back to when I was with Penrith, there were so many boys that um, would come knock on my door. Oh, Joe, can I have a chat to you? You know, because they knew that they could, they could trust me because of like they understood what I players were going through culturally. So, what I would do is again, I'll go and advocate to coaches. Hey, listen, I've got this going on. Maybe you think they go, oh, yeah, cool, cool. But they trust again that, you know, again my voice and. The things that I was able to say, and, but also saying to the player as well, well, hey, listen, if you got this going on, you still have a responsibility to the club. You know, you make sure you're, you know, nailing this, get this all sorted. Um, so it's a two-way street. So uh, finding that balance is important. I think that's the uh, new words I've learned as well, the mana yeah. of it, which is, I mean, it's, maybe it's worth explaining what that is because it seems like that's what you have in spades within the group. That people, people see that and feel comfortable with it in a way that. You know, perhaps done with other people, and it, it moves us on as well to the one of the things that I want to speak to specifically with the RLPA stuff is that the creation of the Mana Group. Um, so maybe explain what Mana is, because you told me before you named it. So this Mana Group. Well, and, I, I didn't name it, but it was a consideration. I said to to Nita Maynard and and to Tia Rona and, uh, and to see as well. I said like you know um, they were looking for a name, and um, I just saw it. It was something simple, but it's, it's significant and profound. And like mana, just kind of really, uh, you know, fitted the narrative, I guess, in terms of what this group uh, and why they were formed. And uh, mana, um, again, is a cultural, cross cultural uh, word that's used across different cultures, but in particular in the Maori culture, mana is, uh, it's, oh, it's, it's such a, um, it's a term of endearment of respect, you know, that. Um, you know, you have this mana. I had this non Pasuka person uh, that I was talking to, and maybe um, say to the team, hey, maybe you should consider naming it mana. And this non Pasuka that lived in New Zealand for a few years, we were talking about words, and he kind of said, oh, there's no word in the English language that I can, that can explain mana. Because it's it's such a it's a it's a word that it's, it's uh, something that's intrinsic that comes out and that's what you know he lived with the Maori uh, within the Maori population there and he said there was just this mana you know you can't really describe it but again it's a term that uh, for someone that's held in high regard respect um, that uh, is an integral person uh, is a is a leader. Um, so there's so many words you can associate with this word mana, um, but it's it's such a powerful word, and 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 that's what I loved about like this person that came from New Zealand that was non speaker that when he said I, I, I can't find any word in the English language to because you actually have to live it and be around people to understand the word, you know, and so uh, hopefully that's you know well, good enough definition. I was, I was just thinking there when before I said you seem like a guy with mana. I was like, can you say that to somebody, or is it something you just have to know about? I feel like it's you can just feel yeah, it, but even if you say it, it doesn't exist. You know, almost yeah, like I mean, it's, it's something that you, it's you know, I guess good illustrations that you know when people walk into the into a room, you just go, yeah, there's this guy, yeah. there's something different about this dude, or there's something different about this this lady or this girl, you know. And there's that's that's what we kind of mean by mana, and it's and it's a positive, it's aura, right? Like you just you know you get that and. Um, I know we we were talking about Wesley Vanacolo just before we came on. I was thinking <laughs> he's a, uh, you know, I was I was telling you I was at a game once in in um, 2005 Challenge Cup final in which he sat with the punters like as if he didn't know who yeah. anybody would recognise the six foot four, you know, yeah. <laughs> volcano with the with the corner was sure. the big hair at the time, yeah. and he just had that that word. I didn't obviously in 2005 I didn't know what it meant, but yeah. that's the way that he held himself. In a room full of, or a stadium full of people who yeah. wouldn't yeah. know anything about his culture, was that's exactly what you mean, you know? Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I kind of mentioned through this talk. That that's what underpins mana is, you know, that relational space that you build with people. 
you know, whether it's the, the battler with the planter with, you know, the CEO or, you know, your main stakeholders, it's, you know, uh, it, there's such a, a practical application to, again, this bar, but that, again, it's, you know, that's what underpins, one of the things that underpins this mana, you know, is, is the relationships that you form with other people, that um, relationships that, you know, that you love people, you know, that, that you respect people, you know, and that, that in itself you get returned from, you know, and people, it is that saying, you know, people don't remember what you've done, they remember what you, how they, how you make them feel. Yeah. You know, I think it's probably butchered the, the saying, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, when I thought about the mana group, I think, you know, the, the players that are part of that group, you know, the junior polos, the, you know, Jane Fisher Harris's, like, you know, these guys that, um, and ladies that are, you know, formed this group, like, you know, they've been integral, they've, you know, done some great things within uh, the game, uh, both on and off the field. So uh, I just thought the name was a a good fit to, you know, validate the people that were in their, in their groups. And maybe it's worth going into what, because this is a completely new thing, certainly in, on this side of the world, but this it does exist in a sort of an unofficial capacity in the, in the English game where a lot of the Polynesian players, Pacific players, have come together just because there's nowhere else I imagine to do, you know, to share cultural moments, religion, mm-hmm. food, family, things like that. And it's, it, you see it all over social media. I know Jesse Senelefeo at Cast has been on it and yeah. Tim Arona, who's obviously back mm-hmm. here now, he, I think he, him, those two set it up when they were playing for Castleford and Wakefield. Mm-hmm. And you can tell how important it was and you ended up, you know, they they did a video recently where, um, you know, Carlos Tumababe had come all the way from Hull, which is like a, an hour away, and you had guys coming from Wigan and Cumbria and all over just to have that moment, whether that be to go to church, to have some food, whatever. Mm. And I think that that sort of cultural space, it existed in the UK because they were the only people like that, you know? Whereas minority, right? Like they were a minority, minority and had yeah, to... You know, there's no other cultures outside of that, so how do we... You know, it's that diaspora, like what's you know bringing that that cool, those core cool groups together, and um, you know, Mr. Jesse and like they were doing that, they've been doing that for years. That we kind of talked about earlier, like yeah. you know, like yeah, any tours that were over, World Cup challenges that we go over, like you know, you know, Will, like Willie Pochin and like the Ali Lotisi, Dave Solomonas are over there. Al Goodenbeal, I remember like they were always like <laughs> catching up with those guys, and like, Robbie Paul, Henry Paul as well, like they were all part of this group, you know that. Um, and it was just, you know, the way I, um, and the way they told it too, is like, they, it was just a support group, you know, how, you know, they want to make sure they when guys come over, that, hey, they all, that they looked after. But especially in the bus speaker space, um, it's because, like, in the collective nature, that the, 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 the pillar of family, Aina, uh, Fano, you know, within our family, would be talking, like, you know, just that pillar within our society, like, it's important to us. So it's about creating, those support networks and protective factors for, you know, players to not only thrive on the field, but also off it as well, you know, so like, and that's just not players as well, like their families as well, like they're having Christmases together and, you know, so, um, you know, that's been happening for years over the UK. And the, uh, if any, they probably, they probably do it a lot better than us here because obviously because we've, you know, we've got, you know, going down the road, there's bus figure communities everywhere where, like and it's not it's probably different now because of the growing bus figure influencer than rugby you know like these uh, second generation now you know uh, yeah you see I think of Jason Gary Gary playing for Castleford he yeah. speaks like me but he's yeah. Fijian yeah. and I think you um, the two lungies as well like, yeah, you know, yeah. I think about like that you know like um, one of the older brothers and playing for France or something like that you know yeah, so yeah. like you like you see now the um I was saw something on um saw something on social media like the two ladies that were having um must have said catch up but they were out looking oh all the way from you know the south of France or something you know, but they all got the guitars out drinking yeah. kava and stuff like that like, you know but that's you know it's just their their home away from home so to speak you know so you mentioned that we're just even even through the middle of this I've pronounced it Willie Poching for years and it's mm. Willie Poching mm. in the two syllables yeah. so there you go um, but just on Willie because obviously he was um, he was coaching at Wakefield mm. and I spoke to him a couple of years ago and he said I sort of put to him this idea that I'd read in a book an African American journalist had written it um, 
who was living in Paris, and she said that when she when she was in um, in America, she was a black girl from the projects, mm. which she was. Yeah. I think she was from New York. And when she went to France, she was an American. It didn't matter that she was blacking from the projects yeah. because first up she was American. And I sort of put this idea to Worthy and said, do you feel that like you got treated differently in England because you would be a Kiwi first mm. and a Samoan second? Yeah. And he was like, 100%. Yeah. Do you, do you, and I think you've seen that in the British Rugby League over mm. the years. The barriers have perhaps been lower because because there is people go, oh, wow, he's come on. He used to play for, you know, mm. the Warriors or he yeah. used to play for the Dragons yeah. rather than any cultural baggage because... With, we don't have any other that's Pacific right. Islanders, essentially. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if that's something that the way that the league is now, that we've we've moved to a plus 50%, um, and you could throw in, obviously, these huge indigenous communities, which is an up to mm. 10, 15, 20%, mm. that in the future, this is only, I think it's only really going one way in yeah. terms of, you know, you worked in the pathways, and if you, only, you only have to look at the team lists for the mats and ball to yeah. see how many different names there are in it that you can't pronounce in my yeah. <laughs> I just can't help on pronunciation now. But I just think moving forward, something like this, like the Mana Group, is going to help break down those barriers because players are so powerful now. You know, we saw that in the, the dispute last year, like the power of the player. And the fact that the players are now saying, look, this is something that isn't just, you know, for Pacific people to have to deal with. It's something that we're, we actually all have to deal with because Pacific people are such a large portion. So... I wonder what, just to sort of finish up, what your, where you see this going now in the future in terms of, you know, I think we've advanced a lot in the last five years, ten years, mm. and what it might look like five years from now and ten years from now. The game, clubs, um, stakeholders are going to be more well informed. Uh, I think they are going to have the cultural knowledge in order to, uh, you know, understand. Yeah, you know, how to engage with Pacific athletes and like them. and it's the the Mana group in particular. Um, to what the RPA is, that they're the mouthpiece for the players, right? So that's similar to what the Mana group is. They're a mouthpiece and giving a voice to uh, our Pacific players who are a big stakeholder within our game. And that uh, you know, it's that you know for clubs. The correlation between implementing these best practices or cultural competency, you know, to get the best out of your players, you know, just makes commercial sense, right? <laughs> makes good business sense as well. From that lens, it's not just all hey, this, you know, happy, feely thing as well, but like, you know, there's return in terms of what it does for your club. Like, you got. Jerome, Bizarre, <laughs> Stephen Crichton, Stephen uh, uh, um, Lenu, like like these guys, like Tamil, Taylor Mays, like go on, at Penrith, they've contributed to the six commercial success of the Panthers club. So, you know, so again, it's not just a fluffy thing, but like, again, if we're talking dollars and cents, like there's a massive return, like in terms of, you know, implementing um, these things within the game. Um, and if you do it, and if, and if you do do it, like all I ask that you do it within, uh, you do it in a genuine and authentic way. You know that it's like it's something that you see value in in terms of the individual first, but then also hey, listen, the the ripple effect of those practices within your executive. You now again, in terms of business, commercial, sponsorship, um, new. Uh, you know, fan base, you know, so creating, you know, new fan base within the Pacific community, like there's so many benefits to this. Um, but it also means that uh, it's got to be co-created as well, that we all got to do this together. You know, that it's just not um, the money group operating on a silo, you know, but it's them engaging with everyone. Because, like, you know, I'm a, a, that's my belief is that, you know, we have to empower everyone within our game. You know, and it's just not just working out in our little silos. Um, like when I was at Penrith, like I gave all my templates out to you know, all the clubs in terms of, um, you know, hey, what are you doing? Think about, hey, this is what I'm doing um, in terms of our cultural event. Maybe here's some considerations, why? Because I want to empower them too. You know, and so again, the, we're just bringing our whole communities together. And it's just not this bus movement, but it's a movement together. Um, you know, that's, you know, Blue sky, big picture, like that's kind of how I how I 
our vision things is that um, we have to bring everyone together for this and, and um, uh, co-create it. A good example is uh, beyond Fizz and Up, uh, Multicultural Run, is when uh, Penrith run out on there with the Multicultural Jersey and that you know, co-created with our players but also with our commercial team. Uh, you know, in, I think that's a great example of this co-creation empowering everyone within our club and our communities to you know, make our game stronger. So. That's brilliant. And um, Malo Ilebe? Malo Ilebe? Malo Lava? That's, uh, I'm led to believe Samoan for thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thanks so much for your time. It's been super enlightening and yeah, good luck with it. Nah, I think you'll really appreciate it. And uh, you're all best yourself as well and everything that you're doing. So yeah, it's great to be a part of it.